Good evening and welcome. I appreciate you coming out on such a cold Wisconsin evening, and I'm sure after hearing Alba Trevino Hart speak about Barefoot Heart and her experiences, that it will warm your heart and that uh, you'll be very glad that you came. I don't know how many of you have read the book. Um, I think it's an absolutely fabulous book. I was the one that suggested this to the Shared Readings Committee. I have used the book for about the last six years off and on, and um, I probably read the book about eight times, and every time I read it, I find something new and wonderful, and it really piques my interest, and uh, I just think it's a fabulous piece. So I'm really glad that Elva is here with us, and also glad that you are all here this evening, too. I'd like to get a little bit of uh, information out of the way before we get to this when we are speaking about the Wisconsin Institute for Public Policy and the wonderful programs that we are having on campus. Our theme for this year is Journey to American Identities. And um, we have had uh, a few programs already this past semester and this semester we are having some more that are helping us to identify our identity as Americans and who is an American and how do they form their identity. On uh, February 26th, next Tuesday, um, I will be leading a discussion on a film called My Family, and it is a story of Mexican migration into Los Angeles. And if the topic doesn't interest you, surely the fact that Jimmy Smits is the star of the film will have an impact of bringing you out. But for those of you that attended our uh, discussions and our films in the fall with Avalon and Miss Evers Boys, you know that the discussions can get quite heated. And so it's a wonderful way to think about where you stand on an issue of identity, but also to hear where others stand on that. Um, we are also having a series on March 4th, um, a lecture series on the 19th century German Immigration to America by Cora Lee Klug of the Max Cade Institute for German American Studies. That will be 7 o'clock. And on March 6th, we are having the Contemporary Immigration Patterns by the Hmong by Chia Yaun Vang, an associate or assistant professor of history at UW-Milwaukee, which will also be 7 o'clock. And both of those events will be held in the theater. The film on Tuesday night will be held in room 233. Now, to get to the wonderful part of our program. Um, I chose this book a few years ago, and as I said to Elva, I have no idea. I always think there's just serendipitous stuff that happens, and somehow you fall into this wonderful acknowledgement. I like, I teach American history here, and I also teach ethnic minorities and women's history. And I like to find stories, true stories, of the path that others have led before us to help awaken us to history. And when I came to Wisconsin, I, as I say, have no idea how I did the search or how I came across this book, but it was a stories, a barefoot heart, a stories of a migrant child. And what attracted me is that the migrant farming that Elvis' family participated in was in Minnesota and Wisconsin. And so I ordered the book and I was really taken by it and I must say, that my students have been extremely taken by the book. It's an absolutely wonderful piece. Elva had uh, spoken to two of my classes, one of Mary Schultz and one of Nancy Hussard's today, and it was just truly um, a wonderful experience to see how she shared her life and how the students shared the impact of her story with us. Um, I just, I think it's a great piece, and I think that seeing life through another's eyes really help opens up the world to us. One of the things I really value about the story, being a college professor, is the value of education that her father had that he instilled in all of the children. And Elva was the youngest of six children. She is the only one in her family to have graduated college, but the success in her father's eyes was that all of the children would graduate high school, and they did. But Elva went just a little bit further. She went to the University of Texas and earned a degree in mathematics, theoretical mathematics, and then took a job in Sunnyvale, California. And as she says, well, the reason I went to Stanford is because it was across the street from where I worked. 
Those of us that know the high prestige of Stanford knows that that was really a wonderful opportunity for her to attain her computer science master's degree. She then went on to work for IBM for 20 years. And to me, the most remarkable thing about getting older and being able to find your voice is there is a life for us past just the young people. When Elva was getting um, a little bit older and thinking about her life is when she decided that she would write these stories. And I am truly grateful that she did, and I'm not going to take up any more time. I now give you wonderful Ms. Elva Trevino Hart, and I thank her so much for coming to our campus. So I, I, uh, I came prepared for, a, for an hour and 15 minutes, and they told me that you guys wouldn't stand for more than 50. So, uh, so after 50, you know, I'm going to get to 50 and we'll, we'll stop and take some questions. So I, uh, I had a wonderful day, and I, I talked for maybe four, four and a half hours. Uh, with students, and uh, it was it was a, a truly wonderful time, and so so I want to start out tonight by telling you uh, who who I am inside, and what I feel like I am is that I'm an intricate mosaic of two languages and two cultures. I can eat, I can dance, I can dream, I can laugh, I can make love in either language. And I put that right on my resume, so, so you'd, you'd be sure to know about it. And um, the title for the talk was suggested by people who put together the series, Connie and others, and, and it's my journey toward melding two cultures in an American world. And I really, su I really like that, that, that they suggested I talk about my, my journey, not my people's journey, uh, some people's journey, other people, but my journey, because I'm the world's expert at that, and, and uh, there's no one more qualified to talk about that. And I also am going to be reading a little bit from the book. I actually copied the pieces out into my, into my speech, and, and it's because I feel like it's important that you hear the words from my book in my voice. I really like Sh Sharon Old's poetry, and her bl the blue dress is one of my favorites of her poems. And I used to really like it, but when I heard her read it, then I could actually visualize her opening the box when she got the blue dress from her father and, and like that. So it was a whole different experience having her, having her read it as opposed to my reading it, because when she read it, I felt like I was there. I was there with her. And I want to make a, a distinction between a personal story versus a political story or a polemic. And so my story is a story of one migrant child one person, one family. And my story isn't intended to be political. I don't have the immigration answer. And it's not intended to be a set of educational rules that you then take and apply and make work for yourself. But because it's a story, and I believe that stories are so powerful, I, I hope that it will uh, be of value. And I also want to talk about being a bridge. I've worked in the corporate boardrooms when I was with IBM, and I've lived in the migrant camps, and I've lived in the Mexican culture, and I've lived in suburban affluent America. I've lived poverty, and I've lived affluence, and I feel like I have one foot in each world, and I feel like I'm an ambassador from one world to the other. I bring uh, the world of affluent America to the migrant children and tell them about it, get them to peer into that world and I bring the world of migrant camps to affluent America to get you to peer into that world. So I'm going to read a little bit from the book. And I feel like by doing that, like I said, I'm, gonna, I'm bringing a different world into the light. My whole childhood, I never had a bed. I slept on a little pallet on the floor. When the lights got turned off at night, it was such a small house that we could all hear each other saying good night. Hasta mañana, Apa. If God wills it, mija. Hasta mañana, Ama. Si Dios quiere. We went around this way until we connected and were reassured our family was all right. 
close and sweet and loving. Lucky me on my small pallet on the floor. The house was situated be directly between two cantinas. Excitement on either side of us. The click of the billiard balls, the throaty smoke-filled laugh of the cantineras, and the occasional drunken brawl. A mom made me come in the house when a fight started. The music of my nursery days started just before the coming of night, like an invocation. I sang Gavino Barrera, El Gavilán Pollero, and Volver, 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 along with the borrachos and the jukebox. Amare Mendoza filled our backyard with Spanish, the trumpets and violins in the background. So I like to read that piece from the front of the book because it, it kind of helps me calm down. You know, there's a lot of adrenaline at the beginning of the talk. And so I, I was going to speak at a conference in Amarillo, Texas. And in Amarillo, you know, in Texas, there's a lot of mariachi bands. So they were going to have a 12-piece mariachi band play during the break. And uh, I was waiting in the wings to give my talk while they were doing conference things. And they came in the back door, and, and I said, would you consider coming in and playing a song right after I read that thing about the cantinas and the songs? And, and so they said, yeah, yeah, we, we would do that. So I read that piece, and, and when I got to the volver, volver, volver part, they came in the side, a 12-piece mariachi band, and the audience went wild. There was like 500 people, and they were clapping like crazy, and they loved it. And, um, and then later over lunch, somebody that was sitting next to me said, uh, isn't it expensive to travel with your own mariachi band? <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, so in talking about the different ways that I felt like it was different for me to grow up from, in, in Pearsall where I grew up, the, the railroad tracks were the dividing line between where the Mexicans lived and where the white people lived. And I always would imagine what things were like on the other side of the tracks. I knew what they were like on my side of the tracks. So I want to read a little piece about the food. And, and I'm going to talk about the different areas when it, uh, in, uh, about in ways that I thought we were different. So Sunday morning at my house in Pearsall, Ama heated the menudo she had spent hours making the day before. My brothers, who had been out drinking on Saturday night even though they weren't supposed to, ate the menudo sprinkled with raw onions, a squeeze of lemon, and fresh cilantro. Popular wisdom said that the menudo slightly slimy with the protein from the lining of the cow's stomach, would help with their hangover and make their eyes let less bloodshot. My father came home with a cabeza, a whole cow's head which had been steaming in a pit in the ground all night. It was so well done that the meat fell off the cheeks. We all watched as Apa carved the steaming cow's head into a platter of barbacoa. The brains, which looked like dirty cottage cheese, were set aside to be scrambled with eggs. Apa reserved the eyes for himself. He didn't even hide them in a taco. He just popped them into his mouth like olives, one after the other. While we were having our regular Sunday morning ritual of menudo and barbacoa at our house, I imagined the white kids across town having French toast dusted with powdered sugar. And uh, another thing that, was, that I felt like was different from our side to their side was, was the dating rituals. So I want to read a, a piece about dating rituals. Music had always been a part of my life. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read little vignettes about all these ways that I felt like things were different on our side of town from, from the other side of town. And then after I talk about those things, they'll be fairly brief, then I'll go into the things that helped me succeed on the journey along the way and the things that I feel like hindered my journey along the way. And then I'll end, end with talking about how things are now and what I'm working on and like that. So music had always been a part of my life. Ever since we lived at Tio Alfredo's house between two cantinas that had their jukeboxes going until midnight. And then the fiestas came into my life with Los Nietos playing every night for a week at the fiestas in the empty lots behind our house again until midnight. Some of the little kids danced with each other and with the boys. The dance platform was in the very center of the whole outdoor fiesta. As an adolescent, our little group of about 12 or so girlfriends from the 7th and 8th grades got together and danced in Aurora's garage, 
We danced rancheras and boleros. We took turns leading and following. My usual dance partner, partner was Manuela. She was my best friend and forgave all my missteps. We all dressed up for these affairs in the garage, wearing chiffon and petticoats and patent leather shoes. In high school, we watched American Bandstand with Dick Clark on Saturday mornings. Saturday afternoon, we listened to the Beatles on the radio. But on Saturday night, when it was really important, we danced corridos, trancheras, cumbias, and boleros. The quinceanera girls had a dance for coming into young womanhood, and the young bride and groom had a dance to celebrate their marriage. And it was all Mexican music. The music of our souls, of our rites of passage, and of our mating rituals was in Spanish. And so that's another area. Another area is, is parental expectations. I felt like the, 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 what my parents ex expected of me was different from what the parents on the other side of the tracks expected. My parents expected that I would work hard to help the family. They expected that everyone in the family would work together and all the money would be given to my father to, to, to provide for the family. And we were not to ask, to ask for too much money to, for school trips, lessons, clothes, because we didn't have a lot. And I felt like the, the parents across town, what they wanted their kids to do was to succeed in school and sports and ballet and chess and et cetera. My family wanted me to marry one of ours who speaks our language and then be one of ours, like stay in the tribe. And I felt like the families across town wanted their kids just to marry well. What I wanted inside my internal callings were to fit in, to be one of them, to act like them, to talk like them, to do what they do, do be a Girl Scout, go to summer camp, dress like them. And I want to talk a little bit about how I feel like people outside the culture, I was telling Connie that I have a hard time with generalizations when people say, your people do X, our people do Y. Like there was a, I was speaking at the Phoenix Public Library in Arizona and, and somebody said, well, I've heard that Mexican families don't value education for their daughters. And what's, I don't know, I don't know if that's true or not, but what was true in my family is that my father wanted everybody to graduate from high school as, as, as uh, Connie said. And so when my oldest sister graduated from high school, he put her picture and her diploma on the living room wall. When my next sister graduated from high school, he put her picture and her diploma on the living room wall. And by the time we had all graduated, we had six pictures and six diplomas on the living room wall, and he felt like that was the biggest accomplishment of his life. Another area in, that I, in, in a place where I felt like we were different is uh, that I, I, I believe that there are cultural diseases cultural maladies and also cultural cures. For instance, um, susto. In, in my culture, people believe that you can get fright. You can get frightened and you'll stay sick and, uh, until you go to curandera and she gives you a limpia. So there's a little, little piece in my book that I would like to read about that. So Ahmad decided I had susto from seeing the snake. So early the next morning, she took me to Doña Tacha the curandera who knew how to cure people of fright. Ama claimed she didn't believe in curanderas, but for the really bad diseases, she bypassed doctors and got out the big guns. She went directly to Doña Tacha or to El Cieguito, two well-known healers, and they always came through for her. Doña Tacha told Ama to bring me back at sunset. She would have everything ready by then. She had lit candles in the corner where she had the statue of the Nuestra Señora de Guadalupe, and she asked me to come and stand there while she swept me with the broom from top to bottom and all around, over and over. And while she swept, she chanted to the spirit that had entered my body, come, come, don't linger, come. I voy, she said I had to respond in response to each exhortation. She enchanted it to come out, to depart my body and leave me in peace. Here in the presence of Nuestra Señora de Guadalupe and being stroked by the broom and chanted to, the spirit departed. And after a while, after much sweeping and chanting, I gave a deep shuddering sigh and I began to relax. Doña Tacha made a sign of the cross on herself and then on me. She laid the broom aside and continued brushing me, now with her hands only, to help me feel that my body was my own. She gave my mother a little bag of herbs. 
This tea was to be cooked for me for the next nine nights and a cup given to me along with a Hail Mary being set at, at bedtime. Another thing was mal de ojo. If somebody thought you were uh, cute or pretty, or you were a beautiful child and they didn't touch you and stroke your hair, uh, then you would get mal de ojo, which was an, an evil eye, even though people didn't necessarily uh, want to send you a bad whatever, they, they, just, they just didn't touch you, then you would get mal de ojo. So my tia Nina was the curandera in the family, so she, she, my tia Nina brought the curandero's magic to us. My mother submitted me to Nina's ministrations for the mal de ojo. The symptoms of evil eye disease were fever, chills, vomiting. She started by lighting holy candles to San Martincito. Then she prayed Padre Nuestros and Ave Marias while she passed a white chicken egg in her warm hand all over my body. And I felt the warmth of her hand as she glided the egg over my shivering body. She seemed perfectly comfortable mixing the magic of the egg ritual with the Catholic Church prayers. I wondered what the Catholic priest would say about this ritual. And yet I wanted it. I wanted her hands gliding over me in her soft voice intoning the familiar prayers. I didn't want it to be over. I felt healing happen through the attention. When the prayers were finished, she broke the egg into a cup and threw away the shell. And then she broke one straw from the broom standing in the corner and made a simple stick cross. And this she gently laid on top of the egg in the cup. And then she put the whole thing under the couch where I was lying. By then I was drowsy under warm blankets. The healing already started. It worked every time. The women retired to the other room to gossip and to hope for the best. The cup holding the egg remained on the floor overnight under the couch where I slept. The next morning, she greeted everyone at the door with lots of good news about how the patient was all better. She pulled the cup out with her eyes shining. Through the egg under the cross, the spirits had sent a message. The shape of the egg designs and the amount of congealment told her the extent of the disease and the possibility of cure. Everyone gasped at the egg congealed into a grotesque form that looked like an evil eye. This was a sure sign of a very bad mal de ojo and also of a profound cure. She interpreted the contours and the colors. The patient, rosy-cheeked and fully recovered. Everyone left the room in awe of healing and the mysteries of life. The other thing I talk about in the, in the book is uh, visiting the homeland. When you come from another culture, a lot of times and you're the first generation, you have parents who came from somewhere else. And so my father was one of those. He, he came from Mexico and he would tell these wistful stories about his childhood in Mexico. And then when I was 17, we went back to visit Mexico. And so this is two paragraphs about my father when we went to Mexico. My father was transformed when he went to Mexico. Here he needed no one to translate for him, no one to interpret road signs or maps. There were no gringos here to bow before. He was in his element. He was like a fish that had lived in a bowl for years, all of a sudden dumped back in the ocean. He became ultra confident, giving big tips and talking to everyone. His eyes sparkled and he soaked up everything like a sponge. He wanted to take our Mexican relatives on trips to the Ojos de Agua, to Lampasos, to Monterrey, he paid for everything recklessly and laughed and told jokes constantly. He was the local boy who had gone to the US and done well, and he was home. We visited his cousin Alejandra on the way home as promised. Alejandra's son drove us out to the ranch where my grandfather had lived. It took hours to get there on bad dirt and gravel roads. Only the walls of the stone and adobe house were still standing. My father had never set foot in a church as long as I knew him and now he walked around and touched things reverently as if he were in a holy place. When it was time to go back to Texas, he gave his cousin Alejandra $50 cash American money secretly and felt like a philanthropist. When I was growing up, uh, the kids across town would say I was Mexican and I thought I was Mexican. My parents would say I was Mexican. But when I went to Mexico, then I knew I wasn't Mexican. Um, because they spoke a different kind of Spanish, they had different idioms. And uh, so, so then I discovered that I didn't, I had never felt like I belonged here, but I didn't belong there either. 
And the way the kids say it now is ni de aquí ni de allá. I'm not from here and I'm not from there either. So it's like for the first generation people, we don't have a homeland. It's, it's like we don't belong anywhere. So now I wanna talk about the things that helped and the things that hindered along the journey. I was giving a talk in San Antonio in, in Texas and one audience member asked me the question, how do you jump from being a child of migrant workers to going to graduate school at Stanford University in computer science? And well, of course, one doesn't make that kind of leap. The road from one to the other is a long series of steps along the way. And at each step, we receive help from family, from teachers, from friends, and from divine providence. My favorite quote in the world is one by Antonio Machado, who was a teacher in Spain who wrote poetry. And he said, Caminante, no hay camino. El camino se hace, golpe a golpe which loosely translated means traveler, there is no road. The road is constructed step by step. So I'd like to tell you the things that, made, that helped me along the road. And the first thing and the most important thing for me was that I had a father who believed in education, as we've already talked about, and a father who taught me through stories. He taught me storytelling, but it was oral storytelling. I, I'm the first generation, not only the first generation in this country, but the first generation that learned stories from books. Before me, it was always oral storytelling. My father was a storyteller, his father before him was a renowned storyteller. And there's a dicho, a, a, a proverb in Spanish that says, las historias no son pan, pero alimentan. Stories aren't bread, and yet they nourish. When I first started writing, I, I wrote first in longhand Spanish, and afterwards I translated the Spanish into English as I typed. And the reason I wrote in Spanish is because I didn't speak English until I was seven years old when I started school. <clears throat> and writing in Spanish put me immediately in the body of a five-year-old kid in a faded dress. And the five-year-old didn't worry about grammar, punctuation, spelling, and not about vocabulary. And yet, the five-year-old could describe the smells, the tastes, the sounds, the feelings. And the words in the sentence structure didn't matter because the full-blown story came out between the lines. I, I believe that there's something primal about our mother tongue and about our childhood food. Somehow, eating and communication with others of our childhood tribe are connected to our animal nature. When I started writing, I felt like vocabulary was my stumbling block. I read Middlemarch by George Eliot, and I'm sure you're familiar with it. It's you know that thick, and her sentences go on for nine lines, and she uses $50 words that you have to look up in the dictionary because you have no idea what they mean. And uh, so that was what I wanted for myself, to be able to write that way. But uh, And I couldn't do it, of course, but when I wrote in Spanish, uh, then English, I just tr would translate it, I had a, I was in a writing group when I was in Princeton, New Jersey, and one of the people in my writing group was a, uh, a professor at the local university. And I would read my, my story to him or whatever, and he would say, you know, that sentence is, is totally grammatically incorrect, but I don't want you to change a thing. I want you to leave it just the way it is. And when I would, because when I would translate it from Spanish to English, it's like the, the, the lyricalness and the song of it would translate. And even though it wasn't exactly perfectly right, it was, uh, it was more beautiful than if I had written it in English the perfect way. So my father's belief in education, every, time, every day when he would come home from work, he would ask me, ya hiciste tu tarea, have you done your homework? And when I would bring the report cards home, he had no idea what A's meant or B's meant or like that. But uh, So he signed the back without looking at the front. But he was really interested in me doing my homework. And he was very practical. When I told him I wanted to go to college, um, he said, well, that's probably a good idea. He says, if you get married and your husband doesn't work out, well, you'll have a fallback position. And uh, sure enough, my husband didn't work out. So I had to use that fallback position, so I was glad I'd gone to college. 
But my point is that lack of money and lack of literacy, doesn't, that doesn't, those two things don't mean that parents can't make a difference. The greatest gifts my father gave to me were his optimism and his ganas, his burning desire to see his children succeed. And the second thing is I had teachers who believed in me, who thought I was worth the investment of time and effort and who believed that I could rise to challenges. In other words, teachers who believed that I was more than what it seemed my circumstances would circumscribe me to be. You know, I was poor, I was Mexican, I was the child of migrant workers, but they saw beyond that. I, I was with uh, Jill Kirk Conway one time and she said I had the light of intellectual passion. She, she saw that in me, and I believe you can see that in your students. I have a friend, Hemima, Mima, who came from Mexico when she was going to start the, thir the first grade, and she didn't speak any English. So the teacher was a young and experienced teacher, and she didn't think Mima could learn anything, so she just put her at the back, or put her at the back of the classroom with her desk touching the back wall and basically forgot about her for a year, and of course, Mima had to repeat the first grade, but uh, the second teacher was an older, more experienced teacher, and she saw the light of intellectual passion in Mima's face, and she put her desk right up at the front, touching her, her desk, and when she wanted to help Mima say a word, she would actually reach out and, with her hand, uh, help her make the word in English, and Mima decided that year that she would eventually speak English better than the English speakers, than the native speakers. And so Mima now has a, has a PhD in comparative literature. So I, I think she achieved her goal. And so teachers uh, can make a huge difference. And for me, I talked in several of the classes today about how math was my way to survive because in English, in history, in band, the teachers could judge me less than because I was Mexican but in math, there's only one right answer. And if you can get the answer right in math, then they have to give you a good grade. There's two other dichos in Spanish that were my father's, uh, that he used to use a lot, and one was, yo no me preocupo, yo me ocupo, which means, I don't worry about it, I just find another way. And that's what my father used to do. If this way didn't work, he'd try another way. If that way didn't work, he'd try another one. And he kept trying different ways until he found something that worked. And the other one that he liked was querer es poder. Where there's a will, there's a way. And so, so I feel like I learned that practically by osmosis from my father. So, uh, so this is a little two paragraphs out of the book about math. So this is high school. At the end of the period, I walked out of English and down the hall to algebra. In math, there was only one right answer. Mr. Giles would have a hard time giving Ruth a better grade than he gave me if we both had the answer right. At least this way, I could come out even. I made sure there was no possible way he could take off points. I copied the problem down neatly, showed every single step neatly, put a box around the answer neatly. In math, I could always make 100 if I just worked hard enough, long enough. My history teacher could judge me less than the white kids, as could my English and band teachers, but I could fight the system in math and win. So even though I loved English and reading best, I gave my all to math. Nothing would satisfy me except to get every single problem right on my homework and on my tests. I hated to fight for grades. In math, if I just did my very best, then I wouldn't have to fight, and I could get the best grade. I had finally found a place or being Mexican didn't matter. We had, the teachers would be imported from all kinds of places because there were, it was, nobody wanted to come to Pearsall to teach. So a new teacher would come, they'd hire her from New York or whatever. And so I had a, a geometry teacher that came from somewhere. And the way she graded was she would give longer tests than anybody could possibly finish and then she would grade on a curve. So I, uh, and I talk, this is a story from the book, but I, I would read, I, I would practice, I'd do all the homework assignments and then I would do all the, all the things that weren't assigned that were in the book and I would practice everything, I would do all the extra credit, I would look in other books. And so by the time I walked into the test, every single problem was trivial. It was just a speed that mattered. So, so I, I uh, 
I would finish her monster tests. And uh, then if she graded on a curve, I would get 100 and everybody else would fail. So, so she had to stop that grading method. And uh, sh she asked me to separate myself from the class and to work by myself. And uh, so it was pretty lonely for me working by myself. I, I preferred being with everybody else. And so the other thing, like I said before, is people who helped me along the way. Successful people rarely make it alone. There's a whole cadre of people who are there every step of the way helping you. The guidance counselor at school wouldn't help the Mexicans. And so when I was in the fourth grade, I, uh, I went to my brother's graduation and I saw that the valedictorian that year was a Mexican girl and it was the first time a Mexican girl had been a valedictorian. And so I thought, well, sh they don't have any more money than we do. They have been migrant workers like us. They, ha they live in the same kind of house we do. So if she, can go she was gonna go to college. And so if she I thought if she's gonna go to college, I can go to college too. And so what it turned out is that uh, she went to the University of Texas and then she reached back to Aurelia, who was a couple of years younger, and she helped Aurelia fill out the forms and get in. And then Aurelia reached back and helped Nympha fill out the forms and get in. And then Nympha helped me fill out the forms and get in and get financial aid. So it was like this chain of women that was helping each other get in um, because the, the, the high school counselor wouldn't help. Um, so, and so I thought I remembered this, that, that it wasn't just me. And so I emailed, last week I emailed my friend Nifa, and I said, Nifa, what was the real story? And so this is what she wrote back, and I want to read to you exactly what she said. She said, when I went to see him about college, I had already been talking to Aurora, who was at the University of Texas. So I asked him about applying to the University of Texas. His response was that I should think about beauty school. And he had some information on beauty schools. And she says, like I knew anything about beauty because all she was interested in was studying and doing well. And so she says, maybe he was thinking about how my family didn't have any money, and yet he never mentioned financial aid at that point or at any point in the matter. Aurora got an application to University of Texas for me and I submitted it with no assistance from the counselor and somehow got in. And then I went to see him about financial aid and about the living situation at the University of Texas, and he said it was too late for me to do anything about it. So anyway, Nympha made it to the University of Texas, and she went on to Harvard after that. And she was one of the lucky ones. And then there was my friend Margie, who was a year behind me. And so this is what Margie says. I walked into his small office and told him that I wanted to go to college, but my parents could not afford to send me. I'll never forget the helpless feeling I felt when he rose from his chair, walked out the door, and before leaving me there entirely alone, said, then I guess you can't go. My lifetime dream of going to college was quashed in an instant. He didn't know my name, who I was, or my record, but he decided that he wouldn't help me. I didn't know where I stood in my class. No one ever told me, and I didn't know that I could ask. I found out 15 years later that at the time I was on my way to being valedictorian. After that, my grades dropped so that when I graduated, I was sixth in my class. How different my life could have been. So Margie was one of the unlucky ones. And, and yet, you know, with people like that, you can't keep them down. So after raising four children, she went back to school and got her degree and got a master's degree, and, and now she's doing very well. So, so those are the things that helped me along the way, the people that helped me along the way, the teachers, the friends. And there was, I feel like, only one thing that really held me back, and that was feeling insignificant. It, I start my book with the words, I'm nobody. I'm nobody and my story is the same as a million others. Poor Mexican-American female child. We all look alike. Dirty feet, brown skins, downcast eyes. So I grew up in a segregated town in a segregated school. And because of that, I felt like I was less than. And I felt like what I had to say didn't matter. And so I, was, I thought I was shy. I thought I was shy, and so I never said anything because I thought what I had to say never mat didn't matter. And I'm not shy. I'm a total extrovert. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to stand in front of you. 
But the reason I didn't say anything is because I felt insignificant. And I feel like that was the thing that helped me back the most was feeling insignificant and like what I had to say, what I had to do in the world didn't matter. Since I was poor, I was Mexican, I was female. And it was through writing the book that my journey toward feeling significant and to being able to talk to you uh, began. Now, I don't want you to get the idea that because of all that, I, I don't like white people. I'm, I'm married to one of you guys. <laughs> And uh, we have, we've had a wonderful 20-year honeymoon. And uh, so, uh, so it's pretty wonderful. So now I want to talk about what it's like now. And the melding journey continues. At IBM, I used to negotiate $20 million heels, $20 million deals and, and high heels <laughs> and, and a business suit. And then I'd go home, and I'd call my mother on the phone, and we'd talk in Spanish. And we talk about who's pregnant, is he gonna marry her, who's in jail, you know, things, gossip from the tribe. And then I'd put on the Mexican music and I'd dance to corridos in the living room. So I felt like I was two people. I was one person at IBM. I was an assimilated, affluent, white, you know, I had assimilated into the white world. But in my heart and in my soul, I was still this little Mexican kid inside. And I used to say that writing the book brought the two disparate parts of, my, of myself together. And that then I was one person no matter the circumstances. But I still have a little bit of a hard time. Like I was in, in Texas a couple of, actually a couple of months ago. And we had a tamalada at my brother's house. Uh, you do that for Christmas. You, you kill the pig and then you make the tamales. And everybody is, uh, you have to do the, the, uh, the cornmeal on the tamales with, with your hands and you have it all over you up to your elbows and in your hair and everything. And then, and then you put the ground up pork and the tamales and, and the chilies and all of that. And so I, I and, and most of the people that were there around my brother's dining room table were, had been migrant workers, my cousins and the friends uh, and all of that. So, so everybody was that kind of, had that kind of background. And so then I got on a plane the next morning. I flew home to Virginia. And I have several friends who are very, very wealthy. And, and Rebecca was moving. She was moving to Washington, D.C., so we were having a going away party for Rebecca. And, and her friends were talking about how, remember when uh, we used to go shopping in, in your husband's jet? And, and we'd go to New York, and then we'd come home, and my husband would say, well, is that the bill or is that my social security number? <laughs> so I, I went from the tamalada to this, to, to this, and I still have a hard time like switching over. It's like, it's like surreal being in one environment one day and in another environment the next. But um, what's changed is that I feel like I, I can exist in either culture. Recently, my book came out in Spanish recently, and so I had a, a party for all the people from my church that speak Spanish. And so I did the reading in Spanish, and we had Mexican food, they all brought food. And, uh, and, so, I, I, and so I spent the whole evening speaking completely in Spanish. Like at my brother's house, we'd, we speak Spanglish. But with these friends, I spoke completely in Spanish. I can go to Mexico and speak completely in Spanish. So, okay. So my journey now, there's a book by uh, Gail Sheehy, New Passages, in which she talks about how people are living long enough to have a second adulthood. And I feel like that's what's happening to me. And she talks about how in your second adulthood, you shed your false self and you become who you really are. And my first adulthood was about filling the hole that poverty had left. I studied math and computer science and I was successful with IBM to working to fill the hole that poverty had left. And in my second adulthood, I'm a writer and I feel like my life is about service. We, uh, in the first four editions of the book, we put this, this thing on the, on the copyright page that says, all author royalties from the sales of this book will be donated to scholarship funds. 
And we did that for several reasons, because we wanted to give back to the community. And the Bible says the first fruits go back um, to God. And so I wanted to do that. When I graduated from high school, the LULAX, the League of United Latin American Citizens, had given me a $500 scholarship. So, so paradoxically, what I have found is that the only way to really fill the hole that poverty left is to give back, to give back to the community, to live a life of service. And when I come to a school like this, my prayer is that I, ha I can somehow be of service to the people I talk to. So like I said, my, my book uh, recently came out in Spanish, and I'm really excited about that because like 80 to 90% of the people that work in the fields now are Spanish speaking. And I wanted a book that, that they could read easily. And I, I, uh, I've, I have had a collection of short stories accepted. But again, I wanted to, to have it be about the scene between the two cultures. So it's actually set in Mexico. There's a town in Mexico called San Miguel de Allende, where a lot of Americans retire. So there's a lot of expatriate Americans there. And they all have Mexican maids. So my collection is called The Maids of San Miguel. And sometimes the story is told from the point of view of the maid and sometimes from the point of view of the boss. And then uh, just last month in January, I went to a writing conference in Mexico where half the people write in Spanish and the other half write in English. People from Mexico, from Puerto Rico, from Colombia, uh, Chicanas from the US, and people from the US that speak Spanish. and. Uh, and, and the whole thing was totally bilingual. Like, if somebody read in Spanish, then we'd comment in Spanish. If somebody read in English, then we'd comment in English. And it was really incredible for me to be able to do that, to do that so easily. And I feel like that's one of the positive things of growing up like I did, is that I'm, I'm bilingual, I'm bicultural, I'm biliterate, I'm bicognitive. I can think in either language, and I can even pray in either language. And I talked earlier about being a bridge. And I feel like I'm a bridge in another way. I feel like I embody these stories in my body about growing up biculturally. And since I have a master's degree and I've lived an affluent lifestyle, I fit into your, into your world also. I have one foot in each land. And through me, the migrant kids I speak to can peer into affluent, affluent America. And through me, you can peer into the intimate day-to-day -day struggles of a migrant child in America and experience that just a little bit. So I think my 50 minutes are up. So I'm just going to read a little piece from the last page, and then we'll be done. And then I'll take some questions if you'd like to stay for questions. In my low moments, I wondered what I was doing when I was writing. In the silence, pure and simple, the answer came, to integrate my Mexican childhood back into myself. I used to think those years, the migrant years, were all joy and comfort. That's all I remembered. But when I wrote, all I got was pain. When I wrote from the point of view of the little Mexican kid inside, it seemed I had nothing to contribute but sadness and hard stories. And that seemed wrong. My intellect and the strong critic in my head wanted to censor everything. My intellect had served me so well in the past, now it became a hindrance. I put it on the shelf and followed my heart. I wrote whatever came. I let myself write the unspeakable, the unwritable, the inadmissible. I wanted to take all the darkness and turn it into luminosity. And I wanted to weave all the old dark strands into the tapestry of my current life. I wanted to eat my experience and digest it until it became a part of me. I constantly had to write past the question, why am I doing this? Would it matter if I wrote or not? And then I knew if I didn't write, I would die inside while my body was still alive. So I decided to embrace the ugliness of the migrant years. I took it into my lap like an unlovely child. I kissed it. Clarissa Pinkola Estes, author of Women Who Run With the Wolves, quotes a poem by Charles Simic. It says, he who cannot howl will not find his pack. I howled in my writing. I saw how much power there is in embracing exactly who you are. 
For me, it is being a Mexican-American woman writer. That's the last sentence in the book except for the last dicho, in which it has become my favorite, my family's favorite dicho because we all worked so hard for so long. And it says, Que bonito es no hacer nada, y después de no hacer nada, descansar. How beautiful it is to do nothing, and after doing nothing, to rest. Thank you. So if anybody has any comments or questions or observations, I, w I would love to hear them. So can, maybe we can bring up the house lights a little bit. So is, would anybody like to say anything? Were you in different schools frequently as a child? I wasn't. Um, a lot of my friends were that we would migrate with, but my father, and so, so, so they would leave early. So the, the first year, uh, my brothers and sisters got taken out of school. And in the fall, when the other kids would get put back in school in Minnesota, my father would bring us back to Texas so that we could start school in Texas. So my father, because he was so interested in education, I feel like he would leave money on the table, money that he could have made with the family had he kept them in Minnesota and had the kids work after school. He would bring us back so that everybody could start school at the beginning of school because it was so important to him. That's unlike most of the experiences of other migrant children. They do go to a lot of schools and it's very difficult. When I was growing up, um, we, were, we moved very frequently and so we're in a lot of different schools. Mm -hmm. Yes. Did they try to like stick you in the ASL? <laughs> <laughs> no, there was there was nothing like ESL when I was growing up. In fact, um, my my first grade teacher, she had all my brothers and sisters in the same first grade, and it was a segregated school, so she was used to all Mexican kids. So every year she'd get thirty Mexican kids, none of which spoke English and she didn't speak any Spanish. So <laughs> for a long time, it was sign language and she'd hold up pictures and she'd say cat, you know, dog. And uh, I talk in the book about how I finally figured out what she was doing when she held up an armadillo. And she said, armadillo, and I knew that was an armadillo, so, uh, <laughs> so then I'd just repeat what she said. So, so there was no bilingual education. Uh, there was no ESL, there was just jump in and swim. And, uh, and if you didn't know how to ask to go to the bathroom, which happened to a lot of the kids, you'd just make a yellow puddle on the floor. <laughs> yes. Um, I've noticed that in the book you did say something about how your mother had a seizure. Um, how was it like, and can you explain more about it? Like, in the... Future, uh, like I read up to like chapter six, but then um, did she have more seizure attack while your all of your siblings were around too? Yes, like I was saying earlier, that I believe that there's cultural diseases and cultural maladies, and and uh, later I found out that that my aunts had the same thing as my mother, and there was other women in the community, and so so it was like it was like hysteria, and I believe it was the Mexican women's like when they couldn't cope anymore, you know, that they would kind of go away and have the seizure and, and be lost to the world and like that. And then the next day they'd be fine. But, it, you know, they didn't have therapy. <laughs> there were no therapists, there were no psychiatrists, there was no uh, get away for the day and go to the movies or whatever. So, so that was the only, that was the only, when it got to be too much, they got sick. And, and so that was what happened. Is that, is that, does that, yeah, okay, yes. <laughs> I noticed that in the book there were a lot of times that you were lonely. Yes. And um, I remember the one part in the book where 
your two sisters say that they didn't want to bring the Mexican food or the food to the school because they were embarrassed. They were afraid that the white kids were gonna make fun of them. And then you said that um, in your math class, you did really well, and for you to get separated from the other students, how did you feel about that? Because you also said you felt lonely. Yes. Um, well, I, uh, I, th I think that was that's a recurring theme in my life is uh, is loneliness. And uh, I used to feel bad about uh, being alone, being left alone. Uh, everybody, my, my sisters shared a bedroom later. My brothers shared a bedroom. I had no room. I was by myself. I got left alone at the end of the row. But I think that was great training for being a writer because now, by choice, I spend a lot of time alone in my room. And uh, if you're a writer, you have to do that. You have to spend a lot of time alone. So, so I, I feel like it was destiny and, and that uh, the universe was channeling me towards something. And so, you know, something that can be seen as bad, and I felt like it was bad, was not necessarily bad and in fact turned out for the best. So, <laughs> yes. <laughs> You had a very successful career, mm -hmm. and you didn't have to write this story. What prompted you to say, I'm going to put this story down? So I, uh, I didn't intend to become a writer. I was doing very well at IBM, and, and, but I, one of my hobbies is genealogy, so I was interviewing the elderly relatives to get their stories down on paper before they died, you know, the 80-year-olds and the 90-year-olds. And so then I thought, well, maybe I should interview my brothers and sisters, too. And so I started getting their stories down. And I didn't know how to write, because all my training was in math and computer science. So I took a local class at the Y on how to write your life story. And one of the women in the class would kept taking my stories home and letting her husband read them. And he was a professor at the university. I was living in Princeton at the time. And he did an annual short story reading and he usually read famous, famous writers. He had never read an unpublished writer, so he asked me if he could read my stories, and I told him that was all right. So he had 200 people in the audience, he read my stories, and at the end of the evening, they gave him a standing ovation and they wanted to buy the book. So then I, I thought it might be a book. And so then I put the book together, and, um, and that's, how, that's how I became a, ri a writer <laughs> without, without ever intending to. <laughs> so. um, you spoke of uh, your mom sending you to do the, the health or health ritual for, to get healthy for that evil eye sickness thing. Would you have your children go through the same thing? I, um, it's, it's, uh, if my children didn't want to do that, uh, I wouldn't force them to do it. Um, but I think it's a good thing. I think it's a good thing to participate in the rituals of your culture. I think it's a good thing to to go for healing and in and to and the prayers and the herbs and all of that. So I I think all of that is is goodness. So, but I wouldn't force my children. Does, does that answer your question? So, so, so my friends and I, my, my friends and I, when we go to Mexico, we go for limpias. You know, we go to the curandera and they do the herbs and, and all of that. So, yes. So I think there's value in the cultural remedies and the cultural cures. Much, much psychological value and maybe some actual healing value. We'll take one or two more. Is there any more? Does anybody have a burning desire to ask a question? Yes. How long did it take you to write Barefoot Heart, and how were you able to remember every moment? Yes. So, so it only the writing actually only took about a year and a half, and. I was selling, telling the people in the class today that I feel like there's a, there's a bell curve of people who, how much you remember of your childhood. At one end of the bell curve, there's people that remember everything or a lot. And at the other end of the bell curve, there's people who hardly remember anything about their childhoods. 
and I feel like I'm just one of those people that remembers a lot. When uh, we moved away from the McKinley farm when I was two years old, and I didn't go back there for 30 years, and when I was gonna go back there and doing, was doing research for the book, I actually drew what I remembered, the floor plan of the house and the, the way the, where the trees were in the yard and everything. And we went back there and I, I was right. I remembered everything, even though we moved away from there when I was two years old. So I'm just one of those people who has a lot of early memories. Okay, one more. Oh, two more. <laughs> right in the middle. I was just wondering, being that you were raised and were poor, how did you raise your children? Did you uh, abundantly lavish them with <laughs> material possessions? Of course. <laughs> Not that I think that's the best way, but it was like I couldn't help it, you know, because I felt so deprived. M my son could have whatever Game Boy game he wanted. Uh, and I don't think that's the best way to do it, but I, I couldn't do it any other way. So I apologize. <laughs> so there, there was one more in the back, yes? Just uh, a lot of racism or any, I guess, prejudice well, for your Well, I, 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 I actually, I don't know. But because when you grow up, with prejudice and racism, you're always looking for it, and you're always thinking, well, I don't know if that's racism or not, but you're, you're, always, you're always on guard uh, against it. And so, so uh, I, I was always looking for it. I feel like it's like you're, you're wounded. You have this scar that, that, that you can't ever get away from. And so, so I don't know. Maybe, maybe they weren't being racist. Maybe they just didn't like me. You know, <laughs> and they wouldn't have liked me anyway, even if I was blonde. So, so I don't know. But, uh, but sometimes I felt like I was being discriminated against. And so even in, at IBM, I felt safe with the numbers. And that's why I went into sales, because I felt safe getting a quota. Like they'd give me a quota for the year, and they'd say, we expect you to sell $3 million for, uh, worth of equipment for the year. And so if I sold $3 million, they loved me. If I sold $6 million, they really liked me. And if I sold nine million, they didn't care if I was purple, you know, they would still give me awards. So, so I felt safe uh, with numbers. And even though, and I think that has stayed with me forever. Even though, when, like when I lived in New Jersey, people didn't even realize that I was Mexican. Like they'd say, oh, Trevino, that's Italian, right? Like Bambino, Cappuccino, you know, that's Italian, right, Trevino? And they like didn't know I was Mexican, and I would be shocked that that uh, that I could live in a place where people didn't even know that they were supposed to discriminate against me. <laughs> so, one, one more question. They had one more question down here in the front, and then we'll be done. So, when you migrated into, into Wisconsin, what part of Wisconsin were you in? Well, my brothers and sisters would know that a lot better. But it was like uh, Lady Smith and Lake Holcomb and, and places like that. I, I don't know the names of all the towns. I was really too small. I just went where they took me. But my brothers and sisters, they were old enough. They were teenagers, so they had, they were into, they were interested in girlfriends and you know like that. So they would have, they knew where all the towns were and what, where everything was. So I'm not sure exactly, but I like all of Wisconsin. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay. Fun.